from Wondery. I'm Mark Ramsey, and this is People Like Us, Part 1. 1996, Zambia, Africa. Connie Modenda came from a family of seven girls. She was the sixth. Being around girls, being around children, was second nature to her. It was what life was for. In Zambia, so many families had someone sick, dying, or dead of HIV AIDS. The disease had not touched Connie. Not until now. Connie had three children, and by 1996, she had lost them all to AIDS. There can be no greater grief than that of a mother who loses her children, her innocence, who diligently yet helplessly tends to them as they suffer and die. You are next, her friends told her. You need to be tested for HIV. But Connie was afraid, afraid of what the test would reveal. This was before life-saving medications for HIV. This was a time when a positive test meant you go home and wait to die. But now her husband was sick too. I'm not doing that test unless you do it with me, he said. And so she went. She was tested. And she was HIV positive. She was put on treatment. But, but how to pay for it? It was so expensive. It was a choice between food and rent and life-saving drugs. One day she was in a market and saw people running to a stranger, a foreigner. Come, come, the woman called. People gathered around her. She had an amazing story to tell. That story would change Connie's life forever. March 21, 1994, the 66th Annual Academy Awards. Hollywood's finest were there, 3,000 of them each man and woman pinned with a red ribbon, a symbol of solidarity with those who had been lost and those who were still living with HIV and AIDS. Also present, director Jonathan Demme, star Tom Hanks, and much of the cast and crew of the movie Philadelphia, a surprise hit and a critical success. Writer Ron Neiswanner had already won the best screenplay honor, and the Bruce Springsteen ballad that opens the movie won a second honor. The night would belong to Schindler's List, but Philadelphia would make a lasting impact in one final category. July 26, 1985, Paris, France. Come in. In the bed, was the emaciated frame of one of the most famous men in the world. He was sick, he was weary, and he was weak. An IV dripped into his vein. I wrote it just the way you asked. Show me. Please, don't make me do this. It's fine, don't change a word. Please. The man raised his head. He stared into the mirror at the face staring back. He didn't, he didn't recognize this face. Pocked with lesions, it was the gaunt, ashen face of a dying man in his 70s. But Rock Hudson was only 59. For 30 years, he had built a career that was the envy of every leading man in Hollywood. From epic dramas like Giant, to frothy romantic comedies with Doris Day, Rock Hudson was never an actor. He was always a movie star. The reporters are waiting. He had known about his condition for a year. He had come to France for a kind of treatment unavailable in the U.S. The press, they knew he was sick. They knew about the hospital trips, the specialists. They could see how sick he was. We all could. But now, this announcement... It would mean the end of the Rock Hudson the world knew, the one he always pretended to be. 
tears in his eyes. He passed the paper back to his spokesman. He was through fighting. That's what they want. Go and give it to the dogs. Can I, can I have your attention, please? <clears throat> Rock Hudson has acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS. And a decision on his future treatment will be made in the near future. Thank you. Does Mr. Hudson know how he got AIDS? He has no idea. He doesn't know anybody with AIDS. Uh, scientists say there's no cure for AIDS. What are Mr. Hudson's chances of survival? All we can do is hope. Four months later, Brock Hudson was dead. I need you go find some complicated. Doctor, what is HIV exactly? Well, HIV is a virus that attacks the immune system, interfering with the body's ability to fight off infections. Thanks, Emily. Yes, the cover of the latest issue of Life magazine says it all. Now no one is safe from AIDS. Officials say AIDS could be worse than the Black Plague. The New York City School District has 946,000 students. One of them has AIDS. But the parents of children at PS63 in Queens, one of the city's 622 elementary schools, they're not taking any chances. When the school opened its doors for the fall term, 944 of its 1,100 students stayed home. Quite enough, my... So, Doctor, how does the HIV virus spread? Well, it's spread by infected blood, semen, or vaginal fluids which enter the body. It's spread during sex through shared needles or from mother to child during pregnancy, childbirth, or breastfeeding. HIV does not spread through casual contact, not through sneezing or kissing or saliva or drinking from the same bottle or breathing the same air as someone who's infected. Emily Jewel. Attorneys familiar with AIDS-related employment cases say the number of cases where employees are transferred to less desirable jobs or even fired are on the rise. Is it legal? Legal or not, they say. It's life or death. So doctor, if you had AIDS and I shake your hand right now, will I get the disease? No, 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 no. Are you sure? January 1983. A passenger train somewhere between New York and Chicago. Filmmaker Jonathan Demme is in a nearly empty dining car. Just Demi and one other passenger. Jonathan Demi was not one to strike up a conversation with a stranger on a train, but he also had a documentarian's eye for detail, and something, something about this man was wrong. So where are you going? Home? Oh yeah, for a visit? No, 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 for, for the last time. I, uh... I have AIDS. It was the first time Demi had ever been alone in a room with a man living with AIDS. This was 1983, near the very beginning of the outbreak, two years before Rock Hudson's death. Demi was chilled, a man with AIDS in the dining car. That memory would last. And so with the memory of the man's face, forlorn and resigned, helpless and hopeless. A man proud enough to acknowledge a terminal diagnosis which led him to the place where he would always be loved one final time. The two men stared out the window at the rolling hills and the twinkling stars. survey by the LA Times, 50% of adults surveyed support a quarantine of AIDS patients. Yeah, I know. In central Indiana, 14-year-old Ryan White, who was infected with AIDS via a blood transfusion, has won his legal fight to attend public school in a district that had locked him out. 
Reports say the boy is now being taunted by insults from fellow students and obscenities are scrawled across his locker. At home, vandals have shattered the windows of his family's house and slashed their car's tires. At the supermarket, his mother says cashiers throw down change rather than touch her hand. December 1990, New York. Hello? Jonathan. Juan, hello, how are you? Jonathan, I have news for you. It's not good. For Jonathan Demi and his wife, artist Juan Botas was one of their best friends. And he was dying of AIDS. Jonathan Demi took a long walk. What was going on? People were getting sick and sicker. People were dying. Nobody was getting better. Friends of friends were sick and dying. And now, someone so close to his own family. What could he do? He had to do something. How could he keep Juan alive? What could he do to make a difference in this, this, this awful, rolling tragedy? Jonathan Demi sat on that bench in Central Park and watched the birds fly and the trees sway and the sun shine. It was as if, it was as if nature in its fullness was showing him the light. I'm a filmmaker. I make films. Sometimes films can change the way people think, the way they feel. Maybe, maybe we can create an antidote to the terrible indifference and hostility facing people with AIDS. What's even worse than AIDS is being shunned because of it, being made to feel less than human. Maybe a movie can be the mirror to show us that people with AIDS deserve our sympathy, our support, and our love. Maybe a movie can illustrate the great courage these victims display in the face of this horrendous epidemic. Maybe a movie can lend this tragedy a human face, one that we can all relate to, gay and straight, men and women, sick and healthy. And maybe in some small way, we can help this country wake up to help these people. There are days that nobody wants to remember and nobody can possibly forget. Are you comfortable? Is there anything you need? For the family of screenwriter Ron Nicewaner, this was one of those days. Stretched on that bed, shrunken, bruised, and pale, beneath all the needles and tubes, that was Ron's nephew, Kevin. He had been diagnosed with AIDS at 18. He was a hemophiliac. He needed frequent blood transfusions. And in those days before tests for the presence of HIV in the blood supply, every blood product carried a risk. You were either lucky or not. And now, that boy, with most of his life unlived, was slipping away. The boy's mother, Ron's sister-in-law, gently leaned in to kiss him on the forehead. Good night, angel. My sweet boy, she said. And then that sweet boy closed his eyes. Hello. Ron, it's Jonathan Demi. Jonathan Demi changed Ron Nicewaner's life with two phone calls. The first came when Ron was still a kid in film school. The Jonathan Demi had read a script Ron wrote and called out of the blue. He was already talking casting. This would be the second call, and it would become the defining event of Ron Nicewaner's life. Ron, will you, will you help me make a movie about AIDS? In the 80s and 90s, as now, people went to the movies for a good time. They wanted their favorite stars and familiar, relatable stories. Nobody ever said, let's go out to see a movie about a gay guy with AIDS. There were a few movies like this at that time, but they were small movies made for niche art house audiences. Jonathan Demi and Ron Nicewaner meet at one of their first story conferences over roast beef and tuna salad sandwiches at the legendary Nathan Al's Deli 
in Beverly Hills. Ron, this movie will only work if it speaks to the broadest possible audience, the ones who are not gay and don't know anyone suffering from AIDS. I agree. We need to have a conversation with people who don't already think the way we do. What about a familiar genre, like a, a courtroom drama? Hmm, maybe, um, maybe, maybe a civil rights case where a lawyer from a prestigious firm is gay and HIV positive and is showing the symptoms of AIDS and is fired because of it. So he sues the firm and is defended by a scrappy two-bit attorney who can speak for the audience, someone they can relate to, a regular guy, someone afraid of gays, afraid of AIDS, someone who, someone who changes and grows into the friend, the partner, the lover, the man who is the best version of us. But what happens at the end, Jonathan? What do you mean? The lawyer with AIDS, does he, does he live or die? Jonathan and Ron stared at each other over that table for a long time. This was 1990. There was no cure for AIDS, no drug cocktail treatment. That was years away. Both men knew one tragic fact. AIDS was largely a terminal diagnosis. They would work up versions of the story where the man living with AIDS, Andrew Beckett, survived. But this wasn't true. It wasn't real. It was cowardly. They would have to have the courage to make in art what they knew would happen in life. Andrew Beckett would have to die. And the people around him, his friends and family, would have to respond to that death. Here, art wasn't imitating life. Art was life. Philadelphia would be a story of David versus Goliath. It would be the first mainstream movie about homophobia, the first to put a face on the AIDS crisis. The movie would begin shooting in October of 1992, three months after Ron's nephew Kevin and Jonathan's friend Juan died of AIDS. Philadelphia would be dedicated to them both. Jonathan Demme wanted to make a movie about the AIDS crisis, to do what he could to help in the face of inconceivable suffering and pain. Today, thanks to films like Philadelphia spreading awareness and fostering empathy, along with impactful alliances like Koch's long-standing partnership with RED, the fight against AIDS is going strong. Worldwide, AIDS-related deaths have declined by about half since their peak in 2004. Together, we have made so much progress, but there's still so much work to be done. AIDS is completely preventable and treatable. Yet every day, over 2,500 people die because of it. And AIDS is still the leading cause of death among women of reproductive age worldwide. In 2018, this is unacceptable. Our goal of eradicating AIDS is at risk. Funding for the fight has remained stagnant, and the world still faces a 20% shortfall in what's needed to end the AIDS epidemic by 2030. But you can make a difference, and it's easier than you think. Join Coke and Red in the fight right now by going to red.org slash Coca-Cola. That's R-E-D dot O-R-G slash Coca-Cola. Can I get you water, Mr. Demi? No, thank you. Mr. Nicewaner? Sure, sure, thanks. The movie was a go. Of that, Demi and Nicewaner were sure, even though it still lacked a title that everybody agreed on. The studio, TriStar, didn't expect a huge hit, not from a movie about AIDS. In fact, the green light was conditional on a trim budget and big stars. And it didn't hurt that Demi's latest film, The Silence of the Lambs, was a massive popular and critical success. Silence was only the third film in history to pick up the top five Oscars, including Best Picture. Water. Thank you. Mr. Metavoy will see you now. Great. Sorry, Mr. Demi, he just wants to see Mr. Nicewaner. Oh. Okay. Good luck, Ron. Ron Nicewaner could feel a lump move all the way down his throat. It was not common to get notes from the head of a studio directly, and it was unheard of to get them without the director invited along. At the end of this long elevator ride to the heavens was the office of Mike Metavoy. He was the chairman of TriStar and a legendary figure in Hollywood. 
Over the years, classics like Apocalypse Now, Rocky, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and Annie Hall were all produced under his leadership. And now he wanted to see the screenwriter of Philadelphia alone. Come on in, Ron, sit down. Metavoy's penthouse office was vast, every inch decorated with artworks, each more precious than the last. You got some notes for me, Mike? Ron, I have a place in Palm Springs, and I love to visit there as often as I can. You know I love fine art. You can tell that, right? Well, on the way to Palm Springs, there's this magnificent artist in this desert studio. And every time I drive by, I stop. I have a lot of his work. There's a piece there. It's just, it's just magnificent. And he's an amazing man, a great intellect, a great talent, a genius. So the last time I was there, his studio was closed. What happened? I asked, where is he? I was told he was dying. This incredible man, this incredible artist, he was dying of AIDS and nobody was doing a damn thing to stop it. Ron, that could have been prevented. His death and the death of thousands like him, it's unjust. You and I, we're not in the government. We're not doctors, we're not scientists, but we make movies. And we have a moral responsibility to do something. So put away your pencil and your notepad, make this movie and make it matter. Tell the world. Now, get out of my office. Another meeting between director and screenwriter. Ron, come on in. Glad to see you. We're close to a final draft on this film, but we still need a good title. Jonathan, what about people like us? I don't know, maybe. What else? Well, uh, what things do we associate with AIDS? Hmm. What about hot cucumbers? What? Hot cucumbers, it's an experimental treatment for AIDS. I know, I know, I know what it is. <laughs> Jonathan, I'm a gay writer, and maybe I'm overly sensitive, but a, 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 a movie featuring homosexual men and called Hot Cucumbers, well, I, 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 I really think that might be misinterpreted. Hmm. Maybe you're right. You know, Jonathan, we're shooting in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. If this movie is about anything, it's about loving each other no matter how hard it is. Maybe that's the perfect metaphor. That's it. Philadelphia. The search was on for an actor to play the lead character, the heroic attorney living and dying of AIDS. Daniel Day-Lewis had already declined, Michael Keaton too. Now what? Jonathan, Tom Hanks' agent's on the line. Tom Hanks was and is one of the most beloved actors in the world. This was too good to be true. Send him through. This is Jonathan. Jonathan, I represent Tom Hanks. He's read the script for Philadelphia and thinks it's great. He'd like to throw his hat in the ring for the Andrew Beckett role. And then the agent uttered the words every Hollywood agent hates most. Uh, One other thing. My client has instructed me that when it comes to his salary, price will be no object. Thirty thousand feet in the air, en route to L.A. from New York. First class is full of entertainment industry folk, and on this particular flight, on this particular night, that meant a producer of Philadelphia and a movie star named Denzel Washington. More wine? No thanks, Mr. Washington. Denzel, call me Denzel. I'll take some, sure. Thanks. So I, uh, I see you reading a script there. What is it? When Denzel Washington asks about a script, you tell him. Oh, it's for a new Jonathan Demme movie called Philadelphia. Philadelphia? You mean three-cornered hats, condom congress and all that? No, 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 it's about a Philadelphia lawyer who's gay and is fired because he has AIDS. So he sues for discrimination. He's represented by an independent lawyer afraid of AIDS and homosexuals. And? And he wins the case while his lawyer is transformed by his heroism and his humanity. 
The lawyer with AIDS, does he live or die? Everybody with AIDS dies, Denzel. Can I read it? Yes. Jonathan, I have Denzel Washington on the line. Denzel Washington, put him through. Denzel Washington has always been one of the most exciting actors of his generation. Jonathan Demi had always dreamed of working with him. Jonathan. Denzel, how are you? Fine, listen, I just read the script for your new project, Philadelphia. And I want the part of the attorney who defends the character with AIDS. I want to play Joe. I'll hit it out of the park. Denzel, you want to play Joe Napolitano? Yes, the homophobic lawyer was originally a white Italian character named Joe Napolitano. What, I don't look Italian? Well, well, no, but... Just change the name, Joe Miller. Make it Joe Miller. Well, we were thinking of casting a Robin Williams or a Bill Murray in the role. Somebody funny. I can be funny. I can be hilarious. I'm sure you can, but the character wasn't written as... Black? So what? Well, if the character is black, does that mean we should change any aspect of the story? I think if you play the part, we should not touch a line of dialogue. The movie should have nothing to do with race at all. Good answer. I agree. Call me if you want me. It was a fine summer day. Ron Nicewaner was alone at home in upstate New York, writing the screenplay for Philadelphia. He often used music for inspiration. But on this particular day, he was moved to tears. Oh, no, it's Russell, the lawnmower guy. Maybe he looked through the window and saw me crying. He saw this gay guy listening to opera and crying. What could be more stereotypical than that? How embarrassing, how shameful. And then Ron realized that's just what this movie is about. Being who you are, no matter who's watching no matter what they think, and bringing them close to you anyway. And so he wrote a scene where Tom Hanks' character, living with AIDS, puts on opera music for Denzel's character, and he gets emotional. What does that do to the straight guy, the guy who doesn't have the death sentence of AIDS? It's that moment in which the homophobic lawyer and the audience feel the kinship with and the humanity of a fellow being with AIDS. Jonathan, you call for me? Ron, I've got some bad news. There in front of Jonathan Demi was a massive stack of faxes. Let me guess, the studio doesn't like the opera scene. No, 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 no. The studio hates the opera scene, Ron. Everybody at the studio hates the opera scene. Listen to this. Instead of opera, can't we get Madonna to do a cover of something? What if instead of the opera, they just talk about sports? I have dozens like that. What if they just talk about sports? I have dozens like that, Ron. Jonathan, we've got Tom Hanks walking into a gay porn theater and having anonymous sex, but an opera scene is what they're upset about? Ron, let me ask you something. Do you like this scene? Jonathan, I love this scene. Well, so do I. Fuck him. With production gearing up, Jonathan Demi wanted to show the real faces of AIDS, raw and unfiltered. Real people, a real disease. Demi reached out to Action Wellness, a local Philadelphia organization serving the needs of clients living with AIDS. With their help, he cast dozens of people suffering with AIDS. They would be extras and bit players. There they were in clinic scenes and party scenes. They were the real faces of AIDS. Nineteen ninety-six, Zambia, Africa. Connie Modenda was HIV positive, and she had to choose between food and rent and death. How could she possibly afford the drugs necessary to manage her disease and save her life? 
People were gathering around a white woman in the market, but it wasn't the sight of her exotic light-colored skin that attracted them. It was what she was saying. People were getting more and more excited. This woman, she was bringing news, and with it, hope. In a nearby town, the woman said, a new clinic was opening, and they were offering people access to medicine to treat HIV, medicine that could save Connie's life for free. Connie would be the first person enrolled in the program. By 2002, 50,000 others across Africa joined her. Today, 27 million people are alive who would have died without access to this priceless medicine for free. Connie was alive because of these drugs. She thought if only her children had held on a bit longer, she could not keep them alive, but she could make a difference in the lives of other women, other children. She could help other people. She could save other lives. And that's what she would do. The real faces of AIDS. That's what Jonathan Demi was seeking. And he found many. Mark Sorensen was one. As a teenager, Sorensen was always obsessed with his complexion, vain even. Now, with AIDS, Sorensen's face was covered with purple lesions. He refused makeup to hide the lesions. He wanted us all to see him for what he was. This is what AIDS looks like. As production and post-production wore on, Sorensen was getting sicker. He would not live to see the finished film. Jennifer, get this tape to Philadelphia. Word got back to Jonathan Demi, so he dispatched an assistant to hand deliver a rough, unedited videotape of the movie to Sorensen's home. Mark Sorensen's mother opened that door on September 16, 1993. The assistant handed her the film. Take your time. Whenever you're done with the film, call me and I'll come and pick it up. Sorensen was bedridden, but he didn't want to watch the movie from bed. So the entire family lifted him up and carried him down the stairs to the living room. The movie was over. He wiped away the tears. I love it. I love it so much. His family helped him back to bed and tucked him in. He died the next day. All told, nearly 60 persons living with AIDS were cast in Philadelphia. Within three years, most of them were dead. Today, they're all gone. All but one. You'll meet her next time on the final chapter of People Like Us Inside Philadelphia. There have been enormous gains in the fight against AIDS in the last decade, but also persistent challenges. There are roughly 37 million people living with HIV globally, nearly 26 million of whom are living in sub-Saharan Africa. Women and girls account for 18.5 million of the global HIV-positive population, more than the entire population of the Netherlands. We can see the end of AIDS as a public health threat by 2030, but only if we increase funding and focus over the next decade. Join Coke and Red in the fight right now by going to red.org slash Coca-Cola and giving any amount you can now. Every bit counts. That's red.org slash Coca-Cola. From Wondery, this is a two-part deep dive inspired by the story 
behind the classic movie Philadelphia, now celebrating its 25th anniversary. This has been part one of People Like Us. Written and narrated by Mark Ramsey. Audio design and production by Jeff Schmidt. Produced by Mark Ramsey Media. Executive producers Marshall Louie and Hernan Lopez for Wondery. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Wondery.com, or wherever you're listening right now. Find a link to subscribe to People Like Us and more information on the episode notes. Just tap or swipe over the cover art. If you like what you're hearing, please give us a five-star rating and review us. Spread the word and get your friends involved. It's all to support an amazing cause. <laughs>